Well, before we get started, could we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for your Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for you, Lord, and, and this place you've given us, Lord, to, <clears throat> to worship you. Lord, I pray at this time that you'd open ears to hear your word. And there'd be hearts that would receive it. And Lord, most importantly, that all the glory of everything said would go to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, <clears throat> first I want to say, if you're new here, welcome to the Bridge Church. We're a pretty friendly lot, I would say. Um, don't be afraid to, to visit with someone or shake someone's hand and, and uh, get to know them a little bit better. I notice as I'm getting older, wow, as I'm getting older, the stand has to go higher. I can't see down anymore. That's how I'm going to get it. Um, today I want to talk about the name of the message is Can God Use Me? Or Can God Use Us? And I, I also want to mention before I get started, which I almost forgot, is that once again he, he talked about it, but there's going to be a baptism. So if you feel that you want to be baptized, uh, that would be great. Um, you know, you're showing your obedience uh, by confessing your faith in front of everybody that you love the Lord. So um, there's no better time to do it than today. Don't put it off. Uh, if you get a chance, they have clothes upstairs, as he had said, and ways for you to get baptized if you didn't bring the stuff that you need. Um, how many of you here have ever thought about how great it would have been to be one of those biblical heroes that you read about? Um, you know, you read God's Word, and you, you hear about these people, and you see all these amazing things that they did, all these things they carried out with the help of the Lord. It becomes amazing. You know, and these men of God, they were righteous. They were prayerful. They were obedient. They were God-focused. They were brave. And there's so many of them that we could talk about in the Bible. I apologize uh, last um, service that I didn't mention a couple women in this, but uh, there are some great men of God that I, I mentioned here, just so I didn't get in trouble. Uh, I want to talk about David today a little bit. I want to talk about Peter. I want to talk about Abram or Abraham. A little bit about Elijah, Moses, and Noah. You know, when I think of these great men of God, some of them prophets, when I think of them, it just kind of humbles me. It makes me think, wow, boy, that's just so amazing. How could anybody ever attain that amazement? And just to think that they'd be talked about today. I mean, this is thousands of years ago. And they'll be talked about thousands of years from now. These were amazing men. I want to start by talking about David, King David, eventually King David. But David wasn't always King David. David's name means beloved. Now, when David was a young boy, he was a sheep herder and he was a musician. And this young man, David, was summoned to Saul's, by Saul's servants to play music for King Saul. And King Saul was the first king of Israel. But an evil spirit was tormenting the king. And the reason this evil spirit was tormenting him is because God had removed his spirit from the king. And he had allowed this spirit to torment Saul. And David played this strings, stringed in, instrument. It's called a lyre, okay? And this lyre is actually, the best way to put it is a little harp. It has strings on it. And it would comfort the king. Whenever he played it, that spirit would leave Saul and he'd feel better. So David, David, great David, he was a comforter. Talk about being used by God. You're a little guy, and here's a seven foot, two inch giant, Goliath. You defeat him with a sling and a stone at about age 13. In fact, that caused the whole Philistine army to be on the run. And David said it wasn't just him that had done it, it wasn't just the sling and the stone, it was the help of the Lord. 
the Lord was with David. Now David was from the tribe of Judah. He became the second, eventually the second king of Israel. And he was able to unite all the tribes of Israel under one monarch. He also wrote nearly half the book of Psalms. And how about this? God called him a man after God's own heart. That's a big accomplishment. 1 Samuel 13, 14, I just want to repeat this. It says, but now your kingdom, this is the Samuel talk, now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. David, he's a sheep herder, he's a musician, a giant killer, a uniter, a poet, a comforter, a man after God's own heart. That's a good resume, isn't it? He's a superhero. Moses, briefly talk about Moses. How about Moses? His name means, Moses' name means to draw out. He went from a baby in a basket on the Nile to the prince of Egypt. Moses heard God's voice and instruction from a burning bush. Would that be cool? He was chosen by God to perform miracles in front of the Pharaoh so the Israelites would eventually be released. You know, he was able to flood. Some of the plagues were flood, frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and eventually death to the firstborn. Once again, because of these plagues, the Israelites were released from Egypt. So Moses was a first-hand witness of God's mighty power. Oh, and yeah, I forgot. He did part the Red Sea, which is kind of a big deal. Moses led approximately 2 million Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. He was a patient man. All the time he was with them in the desert, there was moaning and groaning. He eventually received the old law on stone plates, and he was promised a special land, a special place for him. That was a man of God. There's a real man of God. There's a real biblical hero, right? Prince, shepherd, prophet. He's a great leader. He's a water parter, a lawgiver, and the author of the Pentateuch, or the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Then we have a man named Noah. Everybody's probably heard the story of Noah, right? His name means rest. And he lived 950 years. 950 years. I want to get to like 65 right now is my goal. He lived a long time. You know, I have a couple grandsons. Now I know I asked my wife in the last service. I have four. Um, but two of my grandsons are here with me. Um, and it's Hunter and Dallas. And Dallas is just a little guy, and Hunter's a little bit older. And being the big spender I am, I took him to Costco for lunch. <laughs> I took him to Costco, and we're, we're in there, and we're just visiting. And the little guy says, Papa, how old are you? I said, I'm 58. Kind of, oof, you know, you're getting pretty old. That's what he said, you're getting pretty old. So I says, well, and he goes, you know, you might not make it long, basically, is what he's telling me. <laughs> then, then I said, well... I says, my mother is 97. Well, at the time, she's 97 now, but she's 96. And I said, she's going to be 97. And he goes, oh, that's pretty good. But he goes, at age 100, she'll probably have to have one of those celebrations of life where everybody surrounds her <laughs> and everybody's sad. Uh, so and the poor little Hunter just put his head down. He's just shaking his head. Oh, oh, no. You didn't say that. But he just lets it out. Um, back to Noah. <laughs> Genesis 6, verse 8 through 9 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God. That's a great, that's a super, super great compliment. He found favor in God's eyes. He was righteous, blameless. He was faithful. 
And then, of course, he was involved in the great flood. There was actually two great floods in a way. There was a great flood of evil on the land. And because of that evil, there was going to be a flood. And Noah was part of that. And Noah asked him to build an ark. And he says, I need this ark this certain way. Looking at things, researching it, the ark took anywhere from 20, 40 years to 150 years, 120 years to build. So I can't tell you exactly, but you had to be pretty patient to wait 20 years to build an ark. Um, so, you know, you have to be either nuts or a super faithful man. He was a great builder and he was obedient. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. I'll build this ark. He was also a farmer. Remember, he built that vineyard. And I figure he had to have been an animal whisperer to get all those animals inside the, inside the ark. He was 600 years old eventually when the flood came. 2 Peter 2, 5, I just want to throw in another, um, another attribute of him. It says, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood onto these ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness. So he was also considered a preacher of righteousness, and he received a covenant. He even received one of the covenants of God, that there would no longer ever be a flood to uh, destroy the earth. And he, is, he and his family would eventually be called to repopulate the world. So, quick review. Noah. He was the last follower of God in his generation. He was an ark builder, farmer. He was patient, had of been, obedient, righteous, blameless, faithful, a preacher, and a covenant receiver. Then we have Father Abraham. Abram or Abraham, father of many. That's what it means. His name means father of many. I was, I was talking to my sister one day, and, and she doesn't have any grandkids yet, and she's sad about it. Um, her kids are getting a little older, and so I have a lot of grandkids, so I'm always talking about my grandkids. So I think she thinks I have grandkids as numerous as the stars. And... <laughs> She, before she hung up, she called me Father Abraham. So, let's look at his, let's look at Abraham's uh, character and accomplishments. In Genesis 12, 1 through 4, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make you, I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So, Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was a righteous man. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. The Lord was on Abraham's side. Abraham's faithfulness was unbelievable. He just listened and he obeyed. Wouldn't that be great if our kids did that? They just listened and obeyed? He just went. And what he did is he walked by faith. He walked by faith. He didn't walk by sight. He didn't see what was in front of him. He just did what the Lord told him to do and went that direction. He chose God's direction and uncertainty rather than the security of his own land and home. He believed and he was called righteous by God. How about this? Genesis 26, 4 says, I will make descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I'll give them all these lands and through your offering... All nations on the earth will be blessed through Abraham. This was a huge deal. Having a lot of kids at this time was amazing. It was, it was a true blessing from God. Because of his faithfulness, he set in motion the development of the great nation of Israel. He allowed his nephew Lot. Remember when they just had too many cattle and they had too many animals and they had to split up the land a little bit. And do you know what Abraham says? You choose. Lot, this is a nephew. You choose where to go. Just go where you want to go. And I'll go somewhere else. 
He walked by faith. Abraham walked by faith. Believer, righteous, kind. He was hospitable, caring, the father of a nation. Then there was Elijah, which means Yahweh is my God. Elijah, the prophet Elijah. He was a great prophet of Israel. And he was sent to Israel because of his displeasure, God's displeasure of the king and the people of Israel at the time. See, this wicked king named Ahab had a wife that had convinced him. That's not always the wife's fault, by the way. He had a wife that convinced him to abandon Yahweh and follow Baal, a fraternity, excuse me, a fraternity, a fertility God. King Ahab had prophets and he started following Baal and not the Lord. King Ahab even built an altar and a temple to Baal. So God had Elijah stop the rain and cause a drought in that land. In the meantime, he provided water and food that came from ravens for Elijah. He also, later on, had a widow that provided food for him under the instruction of Elijah. And later, he brought that same widow's son back to life. Now, because of that wickedness, Elijah challenged King Ahab King Ahab's prophets of Baal to a spiritual showdown. Okay? Spiritual showdown. They have a spiritual showdown. We'll see who's the real God. We'll build two altars. You build an altar to Baal, and I'll build an altar over here, and this altar will be for my God. This is the God that that you should be following. So they build these altars, and the altar of Baal... They marched around, they ran around, they cut themselves, they did everything they could. They thought the blood would help. Come on, the job was that fire was going to come from the sky and consume that, right? Consume all this wood, the bowl that was on top of it. And if their God could do it, he was the real God. They tried everything, they ran around. It got so bad that finally, Elijah mocked them. And he said, hey, be louder. They might be asleep. Maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's just meditating, you guys. Or he's probably on a long journey. He's not going to answer you today. Nothing happened. Baal's sacrifice never burned. Then it was Elijah's turn. He set up his offering. And he even had it doused with water. Elijah prayed to God. Fire came from the sky. It not only consumed the ram... And the wood, but it consumed stone and dust. And the people of Israel put Baal's prophets to death. Israel repented and the rain came back. Elijah showed the power of the prayer of a righteous man. Elijah never saw death either. How cool is that? Never saw death. He was taken up in a whirlwind with Elisha. So here we have Elijah, superhero, right? <clears throat> Prayerful, raise the dead, righteous believer, mightily used by God. Stopped the rain, by the way. Started the rain. Fed by birds and avoided death. Then there's Peter, the rock. Peter the rock, that's, his, that's what that name means. He walked as a disciple of Christ. The Lord asked him to walk out on water with him. How cool would that be? He saw numerous miracles that Jesus had performed. He became a leader of the the disciples and he even did a couple miracles himself. He healed Ananias and restored the life of Tabitha. What he did is he got down on his knees and prayed for Tabitha and her life was restored. And he saw Jesus after the resurrection. So here's Paul, or excuse me, here's Peter, evangelist. He's a healer, leader of the disciples. He was witness to Christ's resurrection. Superhero. These men all had several of the same traits, same characteristics. They were faithful. They were obedient, prayerful, righteous. And they relied on God's provision. 
They relied on God's provision. These men walked with God in perfection. Perfect men. Perfect, right? Are they perfect? Wrong. Amongst many of their awesome characteristics, they had flaws. Let's we'll start with David. David, the great giant killer, the, music, the musician, the shepherd, the uniter of Israel, <clears throat> the poet, a man after the Lord's own heart. I forgot to mention he was an adulterer. He had an affair with Bathsheba. And then he basically murdered her husband Uriah. Sent him out on the battlefield, told him to leave him, and let him get killed. If that wasn't enough, he lied about it later. So here's David, this awesome man of God, adulterer, murderer, and a liar. <clears throat> we have Moses. Moses, remember he was a prince, he was a shepherd, a prophet, led the Israelites out of Egypt. <clears throat> he was a water parter, a lawgiver, author of the Torah. I forgot to mention he was a murderer. He had actually killed an Egyptian who was abusing an Israelite. And then, with all the miracles that he did, with everything that was going on for Moses in the desert, which was not easy with all the moaning and all the groaning, <clears throat> the Israelites started begging for water. And he struck a rock, I believe, presumably out of anger because God had told him to talk to the rock. But he didn't talk to it. He slammed his staff on it because he didn't obey God the way he had commanded him. Because of his disobedience, he was denied access to the promised land. Then we have Noah, second father of the earth, preacher of righteousness, covenant receiver, shipbuilder, farmer, patient. He was obedient. He was blameless, he was faithful, covenant receiver, he was a farmer, he planted a vineyard, and he got drunk, and he lay naked. We have Abraham, <clears throat> Father Abraham, faithful follower of God, righteous, hospitable, caring, walked by faith and not by sight. He was a liar. He denied to the Pharaoh <clears throat> that Sarah was his wife. You see, because of her beauty, he was fearful someone might take her and kill him. <clears throat> so he was thinking about self-preservation. See, if he said Sarah was his sister, he felt like he would be well-received there. But sure enough, the Pharaoh took his wife into the house because saying she was his sister out of fear put her in harm's way. That's what he did. He put her in harm's way <clears throat> by lying. But we have Elijah. <clears throat> Thank goodness we have Elijah. Rain stopper, rainmaker, <clears throat> prayerful prophet, righteous believer, full of bravery against all these false prophets. You know what? He lacked faith. After God had just performed a huge miracle in front of Israel and ran from the queen, he ran from the queen Jezebel because King Ahab went back and said what he had done. He'd killed all these prophets. So the queen Jezebel, she came out and she said that she was going to kill him. So fearing that she was going to be killed, he ended up taking refuge under a small bush or a tree. He started taking refuge there. Basically, asking God to allow him to die because he was so discouraged. He took refuge under a tree rather than under God. He became so discouraged. Peter, the Peter whom God said, upon this rock I will build my church. Leader of disciples, healer, evangelist. He was a back talker. He rebuked Jesus because Jesus said he was going to die. And he rebuked him. And because of that, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. 
He was a liar, too. He denied Jesus three times. <clears throat> these great men of God did these things. Men who walked with God in perfection. Perfect men, right? Now, I hope you're following me here. <laughs> I'm not saying these things to belittle these, these uh, great prophets and, and men of God or to minimize their accomplishments that God did through them because God did wonderful things through them. <clears throat> the reason I brought these sins up that they had committed is because some people feel that they can't be used by God because of their past sins. I'm going to stop there for a minute. And If you're going to be baptized today, um, <clears throat> feel free to go up right now. Now would be the time to get up there and, and they'll get you ready. And we'll finish this and <clears throat> go from there. You may think that you can't be used by God, a righteous God, because you're a sinner, because you have this sin in your life. You know, I get caught up in those thoughts myself. I really do. You know, someone might say, you know, I've been drunk most of my life. You know, I, I mess things up. I mess my marriage up. My kids hate me. I lost my family. You know, I'm sober now. But look at my past. There's not much I can do. There's not much hope for me. There's not much hope for God to use me for anything. You know, I was in jail half my life. Half of my life I was in jail. But I learned to love the Lord. But who's going to listen to me now? You know, my marriage was ruined. I cheated on my wife. I lost my wife. I committed adultery. I love the Lord and I've changed my lifestyle. But I'm damaged goods. How could he use me now? You know, I'm up and down all the time. It's just like a roller coaster ride for me. You know, I have these mountaintop experiences with God. Oh, this is awesome. I'm just so happy. I'm just in the word. I'm, I'm with God. And then at times I lose faith. I don't think God can protect me or provide for my provisions. I'm no good for him. There's been times where I have not been bold about my faith. I've clamored up when I should have defended my love for Christ and his word. I'm going to keep following, but I know I can't help now. I have this construction job. I love my job, but every time I get around the guys, my mouth spews out profanities. I'm just like them. I profess that I love the Lord, but I'm not much of a Christian example to them. God's word clearly says he can use you. He used Paul, didn't he? Paul was a man off to kill Christians. He was a gun for hire, hunting down Christians so they could be persecuted. Yet God used him. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16 says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, that the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience and an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You know, it's okay to show vulnerability, just like Paul did. He admitted he was a sinner. We all have something in our past that we're not proud of. We all do. But because of God's great mercy and his love, just like Paul, we can be redeemed. <clears throat> That can be you here today, regardless of your past. God can use you to further his kingdom. If that's all you remember today is God can use you to further his kingdom. You know, we could spend the rest of our lives regretting our past decisions, decisions that truly grieved God. Or you can look forward like Paul did. See, God is such a wonderful Lord. 
and Savior. He has immense patience with each and every one of us. Now, God's hope is that we grow in holiness and we continue in the process of sanctification. He wants that from us. The key to being used by God is to grab a hold of your faith and walk by faith, not by sight. Be a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> Be a seeker of God. Search Him day and night. Go after Him. Be convicted of your sin. Don't brush your sin off as if it's nothing. Confess your sin. Repent of your sin. Deal with the consequences and move forward. Don't dwell on the past. Go forward and do God's will. <clears throat> Nothing could have been easy for these biblical heroes. Nothing was easy for them. They had to work on their relationship with God. They were given temporal portions of the Holy Spirit. Yet when you have made a true confession of faith that Christ is and will continue to be your Lord and Savior, you become a new creation and you receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember, Jesus said, I, I got to go. If I don't go, the Comforter won't come. Ephesians 1.12-14 through 14 says, In order that we, who were the first to put, on, put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. <clears throat> and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed. You were marked in him with a seal, <clears throat> the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. When you put your faith in Christ and confess him as your Lord and Savior, you have put earnest money down. You've put earnest money down like you would on a house. It's guaranteed that you're going to get it. It's guaranteed that you'll get salvation or eternal life. <clears throat> and it's amazing that since the time of Pentecost, those who believed have been blessed with Christ in them. The Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? The Holy Spirit is now living in you. And it's ready to explode. But you've got to allow that Holy Spirit to do a work in you. You have to allow it. You know, you get these spiritual gifts. And if you don't use them, it hinders God's work. You know, you can use those gifts to build others who are weak in their faith. And if you use them properly, if you use those gifts properly, you can build up the church. I want to repeat this. God can use you to advance his kingdom. And great men and women of God, they still exist to this very day. You know, I'm very ashamed. I'm, I'm ashamed of the things that I do at times. I want this loving, intimate relationship with God. I want to be holy. I want to grow spiritually. I want to seek after God. And at times I blow it. I just mess up. I say insensitive words to my wife. I'm, I'm selfish. Bad thoughts come through my mind. I get angry, especially at traffic. I gossip. I've brushed off God to watch a Netflix show. I don't have time to go through all my sins. Be here all day. But I hate when things break my fellowship with the Lord. And that's what sin does. It breaks your fellowship. And I do confess and I, and I do repent. And I pray for God to take those things away from me so I'm not separated from Him. And I pray that, it, that I can be of some use to a merciful God in some little way. I want to share this very last thing with you. I was sitting during a worship night here at the church. It was about a year, year and a half ago. 
And I was just sitting and I was in prayer and all oh, the music was great. And I was just sitting down praying. I wasn't singing. And these words kept going through my head over and over and over again. And this is what it said. It said, Keith, if I demanded perfection, I would never have chosen you to follow me. As it, was, it was as if God told me, I know your sinful nature. And I knew your sinful nature when I drew you to me. But you know what? I can use you. I can still use you. God wants you and I to grow. He wants us to grow in holiness. He wants you and I to continually seek him. He wants you and I to grow spiritually. And he wants us to do it daily. It's almost as if, almost as if he were saying, I want the same relationship with you that you want. But I won't demand it. I'll offer it to you as my gift to you, a relationship with me. If you're here today and you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day <clears throat> that you confess Jesus as your Lord. You know, if you're going to wait to be considered a better person or there's a better time or you want to be someone who has it all together before you come to Christ, you're going to wait a lifetime because look at this mess. We all mess up at times. But the one thing we have in common if we love the Lord, we have his protection. We have his love. And he'll help us through these tough times that we deal with, especially this, these tough times. Jesus was beaten, <clears throat> hung, and nailed on the cross. And he shed blood because of his love for you. He called you. If he called you, he wants a relationship with you. My prayer is that today we'll submit ourselves to God's work, we'll seek his face, we'll be faithful, we'll grow in our walk with him, and we'll remember that God loves us and he can use us to further his kingdom. Let's pray out. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you. We are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for your promises, Lord, to a people such as us, Lord. Lord, we fail you daily. And we're so grateful for your son that died on that cross, Lord, so our sins could be forgiven, that we would be new creations, that we would be able to walk with you daily. When we have a tough day, Lord, I just pray that we could feel your presence, Lord. <clears throat> And the next day, that it would be better, Lord. If we're struggling with a sin one day, Lord, I pray that we repent of it, confess it, move away from it, Lord, and move closer to you. We're so grateful for this building. I'm so grateful for your people, Lord. I pray that you'd continue to bless this church. And we thank you for being a wonderful, awesome holy God. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. It's going to be a baptism. Yeah. <laughs> You're good? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, if any family, friends want to come up and get pictures, you're, you're welcome to come right on up here. It's really okay. <laughs> but, um, so we've got uh, a couple uh, people who want to be baptized. Uh, baptism, you know, it doesn't save you. This is just them publicly declaring that they love Jesus uh, and that they want to spend the rest of their lives doing the best they can to serve them. And so as a church family, uh, we always want to Encourage that uh, and just welcome them into to the body of Christ. Amen. So this is uh, Cameron. Cameron's 13. And uh, Cameron, uh, do, you, do you love Jesus? Yes. 
You want to do your best to, to live for him and follow him? Mm -hmm. All right. How many think we should baptize Cameron? <laughs> So Cameron, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Whoever wants to go next. <laughs> All right. All right. This is Elijah. Elijah, do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you want to do your best to live for him and follow him all the days of your life? Yes. All right. Is it all right if we baptize Elijah? So Elijah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Slow and steady, not a race. <laughs> This is Maya. And Maya, do you love Jesus? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do your best to live for him and follow him all the days of your life? Yes. How many think we should baptize Maya? <laughs> all right. So Maya, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Did we have any stragglers? <laughs> yeah. That, that was all we had up here, unless somebody uh, is just feeling moved. Um, the water's still pretty warm, so you don't have to be shy. But I can't, honestly, can't really see, so if someone wants to get baptized, you'll have to come up here. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Well, if not, uh, thank you guys. Uh, God bless. If you are picking up your kid, they do need to go back to their classroom, so don't grab them. We got to check them out, okay? But uh, yeah, have a good day and God bless.